Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Why don't we stand? This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for this day. Oh, Lord, we bless your name today and exalt you, oh, God. We worship you, Lord, for you are mighty. And, God, we come boldly into your presence today. Boldly, God, do we stand before you and thank you, God, for your blessings. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your glory. God, saturate us today in the Holy Ghost. Let your anointing and your power move in this service today in such a mighty and a glorious way, oh God. How we give you praise, Lord. Let your word, God, as a two-edged sword come forth, Lord, dividing asunder soul and spirit. Speak to us today, oh God, through the power of your word and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Feels good in here already. Man, praise God. Sunday school teacher was teaching her class, and she was having such a hard time. Her kids were just so unruly, and just boys in there just, well, you know how boys are, and and she, she was getting so frustrated trying to teach her class. And she'd been teaching on creation. She'd been talking about how God created the heaven and the earth. And how God made the stars and the moon. And, and then the, the plants and the animals. And then she talked about how God formed man from the ground. And how God caused a sleep to call up, come upon him. And took a rib from his side. And then he made the woman. Or, or he, God made the woman. And so she, she was trying her best to try to get this across. She was trying her best to teach the kids. And, and uh, finally one day, uh, it just seemed like something clicked. And all of a sudden she thought, you know, maybe they have been listening. Maybe, maybe, maybe they have been getting something out of my teaching. And so she said, well, I, I'm just going to see. I'm going to ask some questions. And I'm going to find out, did they, did they, did they get anything out of, out of what I was teaching? And so she said, who can tell me, who can tell me, who was, who was the first people in the, in the garden that God placed in the garden? This one old boy, man, his hand shot up. It shot up, man. He was, he was giving it this. He was, he was so excited. He was ready to answer. And, and she said, all right, Johnny, tell me, who was the first, first people in the garden? And Johnny stood up, and with just as much confidence as he could muster, he said, the Adams family. Well, the teacher thought, well, well, maybe a little bit. Maybe I'm getting a little bit across. And, and she started, she asked a few more questions. And, and then one little boy, he raised his hand. And he, he, said, he said, teacher, I have a question. And she thought, oh, well, maybe they're, maybe they're getting something. Maybe he, he's really trying to learn something. And she said, okay, Timmy, go ahead. What, what is it? What, what's your question? And he said, I really don't know about this devil stuff. He said, he said, you talked, to, you, she, you talked about how, how the devil came into the garden and tempted, and tempted the woman. And I just don't know about this devil stuff because I know how it is. I, when, what, I know how it was when, when they told us there was a Santa Claus. And now I just think, I just think it's just like that. And I, I kind of figure the devil is my dad. <laughs> Just like Santa Claus was my dad, the devil is my dad. Well, I tell you what, these, our Sunday school teachers that have a challenge, don't they? Oh, they, they, they have a challenge in teaching these kids. All right, I talked last week about how God, or started talking about how God uses ordinary. Everybody say ordinary. He uses ordinary people. God, we get the idea that you got to have all this talent. We get the, the, the thinking you got to have all of this, all of this stuff that, that qualifies you to be used of God, uh, that, that you have to have certain 
qualifications and things like that to be used of the Lord. And, and yet, but we look in Scripture, and God uses ordinary people. And, and we talked about that last week with the little boy who had the lunch and, and how God took the lunch and God multiplied the lunch. And just because he had something small to offer, God was able to make something big out of it. God was able to make a miraculous uh, feast for over 5,000, probably close to 20,000 people when you count the women and the children. God was able to do that because somebody, an ordinary little boy whose mother packed his lunch, was willing to give what he had. And because he was willing to give it, God was able to use it. God was able to use just this young little boy. He didn't set out to be even be used that day. He, did, he was just following the crowd. He didn't even come for dinner. He just followed the crowd. But God chose that little boy, and God was able to use him. I don't know about you, but I'm just an ordinary person. I, I, I don't have any extraordinary talents. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a singer. I, I'm not a... a I, I just don't have a lot of a lot of talents in, in 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 me, and and some of you you're so talented you could do anything. Some of you folks could absolutely do anything, but God looks for people that are willing to be used. God looks for people that are ordinary, everyday, run of the mill people. Somebody that's that's willing willing to be used. Now, I know this, I'm, I'm going to talk, this person I'm going to talk about today, and I recently, recently talked about, about her, but I think, I think we need to look at her, look at it again. And so grab your Bibles if you've got them, and, and, or look in the screen. We're going to go to Esther, Esther chapter 4, and look at, at, at this woman who made such an incredible difference saved a nation saved a nation and, and so let's let's look at Esther Esther chapter 4 we're going to start reading at verse 8 when you get it say amen all right Esther chapter 4 and verse 8 Bible says also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy, to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and declare it unto her and charge her that she should go in to the king to make supplication. Everybody say make supplication. Unto him and to make request before him for her people. And Hattach came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again, Esther spake unto Hattach and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king for 30 days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai commanded to answer, to answer Esther, look at this, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace, if thou you choose to remain silent at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. 
Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my handmaidens will fast likewise, and so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish." Mordecai said, go unto the king, make supplication, make request unto the king. In other words, make intercession. I want to title this today, Intercessors Needed. Intercessors Needed. Look at, look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the first five verses, starting at verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We know where our strength comes from, don't we? And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses... The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. I'm in 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Everybody say the preacher should get the right scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at this. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, everybody say one God, one mediator between God and man, or men, the man, Christ Jesus. God is looking for intercessors. God is looking for people who can actually, through the power of prayer, devote themselves to a life of intercession that can... Prayer that can change circumstances. Prayer that can alter things in their life. All for the glory of God. But intercessors that can break through spirit in spiritual warfare. Intercessors that can, that can overcome the powers of darkness. For folks, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our war, our battle is a spiritual battle. And it is through the power of prayer. It is through the power of intercession that spiritual walls come down. It's through the power of intercession that spiritual forces are defeated. We do our battle on our knees. We do our battle. We're not filled with some kind of weak spirit. We're filled with the power of Almighty God. God has given us the authority to pray powerful prayers, to pray big prayers. Everybody say, I need to pray big prayers. God has given us the authority to do that. Luke chapter 10 says, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I give you the power to tread on devils. Quit letting the devil push you around. Quit letting the devil dictate dictate to you your circumstances. Quit letting the devil try to, try to intimidate you and push you back in a corner. God has given you power. Look through the scriptures, and you're going to find people, ordinary people, everyday people, 
that God has used. Everyday people that God has chosen. People who made intercession. Abraham. Abraham prayed and made intercession for Sodom. God, if there's 10, don't destroy Sodom. God, if there's this, don't destroy Sodom. If there's that, don't destroy Sodom. Somebody said one time if Abraham would have kept going that they probably wouldn't have destroyed Sodom. I don't believe that because I don't believe they had been able to find any righteous people in Sodom. I think Sodom was so ungodly and so wicked and driven by a spirit of immorality and sin that God had no choice but to destroy Sodom. God had no choice but to destroy the iniquity of that city. But Abraham interceded. Abraham went on his knees praying before God. Israel was coming out of Egypt and they, God had already brought them out. They, were, they had witnessed the plagues and the miracles and the Red Sea and, and all of that. And, and yet Israel, stiff-necked people, hard to deal with people, stubborn people. Be careful if you've got a stubborn spirit that that stubborn, stubbornness don't, don't kind of get in your relationship with God. Because these people were a stubborn people. And even though God had done so much, every time something went wrong, they were looking back at Egypt. Every time something happened, they were, oh, if we could just smell the onions of Egypt. If we, could just, if we could just taste the garlic of Egypt. If we could just go back to Egypt. But Moses, Moses said, God, don't kill them, kill me first. God, let me stand in the gap for them. Let me intercede for them. And God spared Israel because Moses prayed unto God. Moses said, God, if, if you destroy them, what are the rest of the world going to say? Because these are your people. They are, they are in covenant with you. They carry the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, God, if you destroy them. And Moses interceded, and God answered his prayer. Ezra, Ezra identifies the sins of Israel in the ninth chapter of his, his book, the book of Ezra. But Ezra interceded and repented for a nation, repented before God. There's been more than once that I've walked across this sanctuary, and I said, God, I repent for the sins of our nation. I repent for the sins of our nation. I repent for the iniquity of our nation. I repent every time we've killed an unborn baby. I repent because of the immorality and sin of our nation. We need to stand in the gap. Intercessors are needed. Elijah, Elijah prayed in 1 Kings chapter 18 as he stood face to face. He stood face to face with the prophets of Baal. And Elijah stood there between the children of Israel and the prophets of Baal. And he prayed a simple prayer. God, just reveal yourself. God, just show yourself. Just a few words and all of a sudden fire comes down from heaven and consumes a sacrifice because somebody was willing to intercede. Daniel interceded for his people. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 a prayer of intercession. Folks, intercessors are needed. And if we've learned anything, if we have learned anything over the past two years, we have definitely learned that life it takes so many unexpected turns and twists. We've learned that. COVID taught us that. Life takes turns and twists we don't expect. Life takes, goes different ways and, and, and we don't always see it coming and all of a sudden the bottom drops out. Folks, we all felt like that two years ago in 2020. We all felt like our nation, we, we had lost our freedom. We had lost, we, we had lost so much over a, a disease, a sickness, a virus. And we felt that way. We were shut in our homes. We weren't supposed to even go out. We weren't supposed to be around. I can't be six feet away from you. And you got to be six feet away from me. We couldn't shake hands. Couldn't do anything. 
We fell at the bottom. It's just completely fallen out. And things happen and we're forced to deal with financial situations and family situations and health situations and things that we never planned. Things that, that, that come along. Sometimes, quite honestly, we're not ready to face them. We're not, we're not ready to deal with them. Oh, I'm glad we serve a God that's a way maker. <laughs> like water rushing down a hill, God makes a way. You ever tried to stop water rushing down a hill? That's not easy. And like water rushing down a hill, God makes a way. And sometimes he, he works around the obstacles in our life. And sometimes he just over, overruns the obstacles in our life. But he always makes a way. He, makes, he made a way when the flood came through Noah. He, he made a way with Moses through the Red Sea. He, he, he made a way for Joshua to conquer Jericho. He, he made a way for David to defeat the giant. God makes a way. Life is not like the novels we read. You know, most, most authors kind of give you an indication trouble's coming in the book. They, they, they give you, they give you a, a little hint that something's getting ready to happen and, and, and things like that or, or things are going to transpire. But in the book of Esther, all of a sudden, Haman shows up. Haman. Now, Haman didn't show up anywhere until he was promoted. It's like he came out of nowhere. It's like he was kind of forced into the story. And Haman, Haman didn't have any introduction. Haman, Haman had nothing. He just showed up. And all of a sudden, Haman is the prime minister of the nation. He, he's got this power and authority. And the Bible describes him as an agite. In other words, he's probably, probably an Amalekite. Which was, Amalekites were natural born enemies of Israel. And now here's Haman with all this authority. And all this power, and in chapter 3 of the book of Esther, he's, he's promoted. And, and Haman's promotion made him, made him prime minister. And because he was prime minister, people had to bow to him. They were required to bow to Haman. This man who came out of, out of nowhere. And, and Haman, Haman uh, liked it. He, he liked it that they had to give him reference. It, it, it brushed his ego. He liked it when he walked in the room and people had to stop what they were doing and bow on the floor to him. And, and Haman, Haman, you know, he, now he's only one of the characters in the story. You got a Hazarus. Hazarus was the king, and he was the king of the superpower of his day. Is the superpower of a Hazarus day and the Medo Persian Empire. And, and then there's, of course, Esther. Esther's just a, a young Jewish girl living in a strange land. This is not even Esther's home. She had been, she had been ripped from her home. She had been taken from her home as, and, and taken into captivity in another nation. Just a young woman in, in the empire who ends up becoming the wife of Ahasuerus. Out of nowhere, this, this, this little Jewish girl, it, it becomes all of a sudden uh, the queen of the Medo-Persian empire. And Ahasuerus had already got rid of her, her predecessor, Queen Vashti, because Vashti refused to, to uh, exploit herself and dis dis display herself before the, the leaders of the kingdom. And so he was mad and he had to save face. And to do that, he got rid of Vashti. And then there's Mordecai. Mordecai was the adoptive father of Esther. And, of course, Haman in the story, the prime minister, and Haman becomes the villain. Haman is the villain in the story. He, he's, he's the one that, that you've got to watch out for. And the problem arose when Mordecai, the adoptive father of Esther, Mordecai refuses to bow before Haman. Haman's coming down the street. I'm sure he's got a, a Donald Trump entourage. 
I'm sure it's, it's, it's wagon after wagon, security after security, men on horses, men marching, all in, in heavy armor to protect the prime minister of the kingdom. And everybody, everybody, when they see him coming, everybody turns and they bow except one man. And Mordecai says, I only bow to God. You know, you've got to take a stand for your principles. You've got to take a stand for your, now it's, it's going to cost you something sometimes. But you've got to take a stand for your principles. Mordecai I said, I won't bow. And it angered Haman so much. He wasn't just mad at, at Mordecai. He was mad at the, all of the Jewish people, mainly because the Amalekites hated the Jews. So what an opportunity. He's got the ear of Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus can listen to him. He can tell him what to say. And, and so Haman goes to Ahasuerus. And he said, there's this people. And they're not going to listen to you because they're not going to serve you because they serve another God. And so the best thing you can do is destroy this people. Destroy all of them. See, his, his, his anger and his pride and everything that was in, in Haman that, that rose up and his indignation, he, his ultimate goal was to get rid of Mordecai. But he, he said, let's, let's get rid of Mordecai by getting rid of everybody. And so, so Haman, enraged as he was, said, put Esther chapter 3 and verse 8 up. Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there's a certain people scattered abroad, dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people, not from our people, from, from your laws. Their laws are different. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them, to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. Haman had whispered into the ear of the king, and Haman decided that on the 13th day, of the 12th month, the Jews were going to be executed. Every single Jew in the kingdom. Every single, every single one of them. When the decree was sealed with the king's seal, it could not be revoked. There could be no change to his decree. Boy, that was a dark day. When that decree was nailed on the post throughout the kingdom and everybody started reading it, all of a sudden they realized Something was going to happen. Let me tell you something. Oil and water don't mix. Shake them up all you want. They don't mix. Oil is always going to be separate from water. It will always rise to the top. You always see the, the, the bubbles on, on the inside because they don't mix. I don't care how long you shake the bottle. Oil, oil and water don't mix. You stop shaking it and the oil floats up. Separates itself from the water. Let me tell you something else that don't mix. The devil and the church don't mix. Don't mix. Devil and the church don't mix. If they ever do, it's a sad day for the church. If they ever do. And as long as the church is the church, we are always going to be at odds with Satan. We're always going to be at odds with every devil. Every spirit that resists the spirit of Antichrist that already exists in the world. The church is at odds with all. You wonder why people hate the church? Because we are at odds with everything they stand for. We're at odds with every spirit that controls the decisions that's being made. And we live in a day when Satan is becoming relentless. If not becoming, he's already been relentless, but he is relentless in his quest to destroy the bride of Christ. He is relentless. He, he's not resting today. He's not taking a day off because it's the Lord's day, because it's Sunday. He's not taking a day off because we come to church. 
He knows we're coming here and we're coming to approach Jesus. We're coming to come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's not taking a day off. As a matter of fact, he'll do everything in his power to keep us out of here. He'll do everything in his power to keep us from worshiping, to keep us from praying, to keep us from being touched by God and touching God. And he's leaving no stone unturned. No plan. He's, he's using every weapon in his arsenal to do everything that he can to try to destroy the church, to try to hinder the church. And there's not one of you, there's not one saint untouched. There's not one saint of God that Satan is not going to try to do something not one family he's not going to try to destroy. See, he's got a, he's got a three-pronged attack. He's got a three-pronged attack. Uh, number one, he tries to slip in false doctrine. He tries to slip in compromise into the church. And if he can't do that, then he tries to intimidate the church. He tries to make us think we're powerless against the powers of darkness. And then, if he can't do that, he tries to lull us to sleep. He tries to get us so comfortable, so at ease in Zion. He tries to get us lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, just warm enough to feel like we're warm and cold enough to feel like, oh, we're not that far from the world. And he tries, he tries to do that so, because that's when we're ineffective. That's when we're ineffective. We can't be effective when we're, when we're lukewarm. And everything he can do in this, in this world that we live in, in this dark world that we live in, Satan likes to work, and he works under the cover of darkness. He likes darkness. He doesn't, I don't know, maybe he doesn't think God can't see him in the dark. But he likes to work under the cover of darkness. But the thing is, folks, you don't have to despair. You don't have to worry. Our God is light, and light always dispels darkness. Our, the light always pushes back. In, in creation, the Bible says, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, but the Spirit of God moved. Darkness was on the face of the deep, but the Spirit of God was able to move even in the darkness. Light, dark, darkness on the face of the earth, but God was moving. And then God said, let there be light. And that light drove back the darkness. When Jesus, fourth watch of the night, when it was the darkest, Jesus came walking on the water. I'm to, what are you saying? I'm saying that don't lose hope because even in the darkness, God is able to come walking on your storm. God is able to come walking. But we need intercessors. We need somebody that will pray and pierce the darkness. We need somebody that will cry aloud and spare not. We need somebody that will cry out to God. We need intercessors. Put Esther 414 up. Esther 4.14 says, For if thou all, if thou altogether holdest thy peace, if you remain silent, if you refuse to cry out and spare not, if you refuse, if you if you just don't, and it's not that sometimes you even refuse to do it, you just don't do it. If, 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 you, if you just stay quiet and not pray, there shall come an enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews. Somebody's going to pray is what he's saying. Somebody's going to call out. Somebody is going to be an intercessor. God is going to find somebody. I don't want some God to stop by here looking for somebody. And God said, well, there's nobody there, so I'll just move on to another people, to another church. No, when God steps in, I want him to find a people that is in the first united Pentecostal church of Ravenswood that will intercede and pray. That'll cry out before God. 
But thou, if you hold your peace, thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. He didn't know how it would come. But he knew it would come. He didn't know where it would come from. But he knew it would come. And Mordecai understood. Because there is a collaboration. There is a relationship between the working of a sovereign God and humanity. There's a collaboration when the Spirit of God is moving. And when God moves, God works with somebody. All of a sudden, there's a, there's a symbiotic relationship between, between the sovereign God and an ordinary person. There's a, there's a relationship that, that begins when somebody becomes an intercessor, when somebody cries out before God, when somebody starts piercing the darkness of this world with their prayers, when somebody refuses to be silent. There's a relationship before with God, and God works through the response of humanity. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying God is in control, but God works through people like me and like you. Amen. That's how God chooses to work. That's why God said in Galatians chapter 1, though any angel preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Even an angel can't do what God has called you to do. Even an angel. Angels are ministering spirits. There's angels in here right now. There's angels in there. They're, 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 they're standing around the walls. They're standing in the pews. There's angels in this place. But they can't do what you can do. Because God works with humanity. God, God chooses you to stand in the gap. God chooses you to make intercession. And Mordecai made himself available to God. And when he made himself available to God, he did what he knew to do. He interceded. He went and sat on the palace, by the palace gate, and he put on his sackcloth and ashes. He went in mourning, and he sat by the palace gate. Esther, Esther said, I can't go because the king hasn't called me. So somebody had to intercede. And so Mordecai put on his, his sackcloth. I wish I'd brought, I, when I was in Israel, a couple, several years ago, I bought a prayer shawl. I, it's, hang, it's in my office right now. I wish I'd brought it in because I'd have put that on. Like, hey, like Mordecai, I'll put on his, his sackcloth. And he, he sit there until he got the attention of Esther. And Esther sent to him because she was grieved that he was sitting there like that. She, she, was, she was grieved, and, and she sent her chamberlain to find out what was wrong. And, and Mordecai told her about the decree of Haman. And Mordecai told her that the, the people were in, in desperate need of her going before the king. And, and I can tell you, Esther wasn't real enthusiastic. Esther hadn't been called, and she wasn't real enthusiastic. And she did. She knew that if the scepter, as if the scepter wasn't extended, she, she it was death for her. It was death. It was risky for her to go before the king. But Mordecai I knew Esther wasn't there by chance. How many believe the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord? I believe that. I absolutely believe that. I believe that every day. I don't think there's a day. There's not a day. God doesn't order the steps of the righteous. And Mordecai knew she was there for a reason, and he refused to accept her excuse and told her, take the risk, because she really had no choice. 
Because if she didn't, she would not survive. There would, a deliverance would come, but not for her and not for her family. Who knows if thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Do you realize God is never surprised? Never. God is never surprised. No, pro no problem so difficult, God can't solve it. No situation that God can't move. And God always uses ordinary people like me and you. He used order Mordecai to inspire Esther. He used Esther to intercede for a nation and for a people. Put Romans 8, 26 up. Paul described the role of the intercessor. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I've been in incredible prayer meetings and I've watched as men and women started in prayer but moved into a, a point of intercession as they began and it sounded like uh, as they were praying it just sounded like there were there were there were um, groanings that were coming from a depth down in their spirit as they cried out to God and, and you couldn't under you couldn't make it out you couldn't understand but there was something that was happening in the spirit there folks when the spirit starts moving through you when the Holy Ghost starts using you to intercede through you it's not going to be pretty and it's not going to make sense and it's going to be exhausting but through that God is going to God is going to attack spirit spiritual darkness through that God is going to bring down spiritual barriers through that God intercessors are needed verse 27 and he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God I've shared this story with you, but maybe some of you have not heard it. Brother Billy Cole, Pastor Billy Cole, my pastor, before he passed, was a missionary to Thailand. Him and Sister Cole and their daughter Brenda were in Thailand, and they they uh, were trying to preach the gospel there. And boy, they were they were fighting. Thailand is a a Buddhist nation, and and uh, you know here yeah, we're most the United States we're mostly mostly Christian. Uh, we may not all be apostolic, but we're most, mostly Christian. And so we're not, we're not too uncomfortable in our nation being Christian. But if you go to Thailand and you start preaching the gospel uh, to, to people. Most of them never even heard the name Jesus. And so they're over there. Their daughter becomes very ill, very ill. And she had picked up something there in the nation. And there was a new convert that was in uh, Canada, young, a young convert, brand new. He wasn't a seasoned saint. He, he wasn't an elder in the church. He was a new convert, come in out, off the streets, got the Holy Ghost. And he was praying in his home one night, and God gave him a vision. And he saw a family, and he, could, he knew this was a missionary family, and he saw a little blonde girl. And, and as he was praying, he was praying through the Spirit, the Holy Ghost praying through him. And, and he realized he was praying for that little blonde girl. He didn't know what, what it was. He, didn't under, he, didn't, he, he had no clue, but he knew in the Spirit he was praying for that little blonde girl. And so next service, he goes to his pastor. He says, do we have missionaries uh, somewhere in the world, a man, a woman, and a little girl? And, and he, pa pastor said, well, we've got missionaries everywhere around the world. And, and, and so he said, he said, I don't know. He said, I was praying for missionaries last night, and I was praying for this little blonde girl in, in this nation. And I was, I was really interceding for years past. And, and Brother Cole was traveling, and he ended up in Canada. And a 
pastor came up to him, and, and Brother Cole related that story of his daughter because all of a sudden, one night, his daughter, who was so sick, all of a sudden, she got well out of nowhere. She got well. And, and so the pastor who knew the story of the convert came up to him, and he was relating the story. And Brother Cole said, when did this happen? And, and the, uh, the pastor told him when it happened. And Brother Cole started thinking back, and he said, that's exactly when Brenda got well. That's exactly when the sickness left her. That, that intercession. He didn't know, but he intercessed. Just a regular, ordinary person. And God chose him and used him to intercede for her. Folks, we need intercessors. We need people that will intercede in the spirit. Ordinary people. And you know the story. And I got to, man, I'm over time already. You know the story. Esther went before the king. The king, the king accepted her dinner invitation. She comes and eventually reveals what Haman's plan is. And the king turns everything around. And Haman becomes the one hanging from the noose that he built in his backyard for Mordecai. Haman died the death he had intended for an intercessor for a young man that allowed God to use him. And one of the unusual things about the book of Esther, God's not mentioned one single time, but yet we see his fingerprints all over that book. We see his hand all over that book. I close with Ezekiel 22 and verse 30. God said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge. Stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. He said, I'm searching. I need intercessors. I need somebody that will stand in the gap. Somebody that will allow God to use you. Somebody that will pray in the spirit and intercede before God. Just an ordinary person. Just a, a saint on a pew somewhere. I need intercessors. Stand with me. Stand with me. i got to quit. Stand with me. Jesus, today, I thank you for your word. Lord, I felt it of power and an anointing upon me as I've delivered your word today. For God, I believe you have spoke to your people. I believe your word has come forth today, Lord, for we need people who will stand in the gap. God, we need people today. God, that will rise up and say, Lord, Lord, I'm here. I'm available. I'll put on sackcloth and ashes, and I will intercede. I'll step. I'll sit on the gate of the king's palace until, Lord, I get your attention. I'll pray until the tide turns. I'll pray until the circumstance change. I'll pray.